action. Yeah. Hey. We actually were set to launch this program back in March of 2020. So the very first program, I think, was like March 13th. And we were like, no, we can't do it. I'm trouble. But it actually ended up being a great success um, on Zoom. And it's been a really fun opportunity to kind of spotlight different women leaders in the region. Um, get to know them. So today, we have uh, Paula Harris from WH Cornerstone Investments. And we have Megan Steinberg from Steinberg HR. I'm just going to take a couple minutes here at the beginning to recognize our sponsors, which are located here, and also to just do a quick uh, bio for both of them. But before I get started, I'm going to put Peter on the spot to give <laughs> you a little story about the fun button that he put out this morning. Um, the Chamber before we record. <laughs> uh, Chamber Archives, so an annual meeting we had years ago, and our next one is next Friday. We honor Renee for her two years as past chair. We had our annual lunch to honor Paula in her chair. I tried to mount a campaign because Paula is fairly political to recruit her to run for office as her next career move. So, <laughs> if you want to put her on the spot while she's at the camera, figure out when she's going to run for office. We got a campaign crew ready She to should run. <laughs> anyway, just thought that'd be a little fun. So Don't do a button for me, Peter. Right? I'm not running. <laughs> she's she's ready. not running. Oh, 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 Oh boy. Oh, anyway. oh boy. Right. That's so bullshit. let me just start by recognizing our sponsors for 2022 uh, George Washington Tacoma, Hollywood Agency of the Hollywood Bay here, Enbridge, Mountain One Bay, Mass General Brigham, Partners for Performance, Jeff Collins, and Cyber HR. Do I have it, Katie? Are you there? Mary Kate? Mary Kate? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so thank you all for the support of this program. For the bios. So I'm going to just start with Megan. Megan Steinberg is a human resources professional and owner and principal of Steinberg HR. She started the business four and a half years ago, just about a year before the pandemic hit. Um, she has a strong operational background with experience in the hospitality and higher education industry. She's a guest lecturer at Boston University, and she is um, an active volunteer at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit more about herself, but that's uh, Megan Steinberg. We're excited to have her as moderator and sponsor for this year. And then we have Paula Harris here today, who um, you know is a former chair of the South Shore Chamber of Commerce. She is the co-founder of WH Cornerstone Investments, a part-time or part financial advisor and part dream architect who takes great pride in helping her clients particularly widowed women obtain financial peace of mind while they get back on their feet, rise up and navigate their path forward. She is also an author of uh, Rise Up, a Widow's Journal, which you can find on Amazon. She enjoys assisting people in the life planning that goes hand in hand with financial planning and is the creator of Rise Up Success Training and Retreats. She has a YouTube channel called Wisdom Wednesday. So check that out. Mm -hmm. And um, she is... Uh, it's a passion project that she launched during the pandemic to bring her ponderings, positivity, and prayer to the world of West Virginia. So we're excited to have you here today. We'll open it up for some questions uh, at the end. Awesome. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. This is actually my first time in person doing this since pre-pandemic, so this is really great, and it's good to, to see everybody. Um, so Steinberg HR is a small boutique women-owned consulting firm, human resource consulting firm, and we provide part-time interim and project-based support to really to the mid-size, well, two employees upwards to about 200. There is north of that, but that's really the sweet spot, um, primarily in Massachusetts, but we also work throughout New England and um, New York and, and that in different states. So. I feel really blessed. Um, I was so scared to, to take the leap and to start. Um, best decision I've ever made. And uh, just feel really, really blessed with the clients. And um, I was just saying earlier, you know, the clients that we support are either they know exactly what they need 
and they need help kind of getting projects over the finish line in regards to their people and their culture and their process. Or it's clients that say, I, I just want to either do better and I know I need to do better. I just don't know how to get there or I don't even know where to start. Can you help me? So it's been really just an awesome journey. And we work with multiple different industries, which makes it really, really interesting. So I'm excited. It's been really great. So Paula and I spent some time together. I didn't know, and I'm a little embarrassed to say, I didn't know everything about Paula beforehand. <laughs> so it's, well, you're, you're very well known. And now I feel like so honored. Um, but it's been really interesting because she wears so many different hats um, and do it not only just speaking with her and then just doing research. It's, you know, with Cornerstone and then, you know, you, you also have your Wisdom Wednesday. So if you haven't already taken a look at it, they're just really quick snippets. Um, I, I purchased her, her book as well to take a look at, you know, what goodies are in here. And I would highly suggest we talk a little bit more about it, but there's just so many different hats. And what I really, um, I guess, respect is how you how you're able to intertwine everything. So I guess if you could talk a little bit about you know personally and professionally and just what you're passionate about, how uh, as you've grown, you know, through all the different things and all your different experiences, how have you know how have you connected the dots and how do you feel actually comfortable bringing personal into your professional? A lot to unpack in there. Um, the other thing that, if you don't already know me, I also work with my husband, so that adds another dimension. Wow. Um, and we, we, June second was the 38th anniversary of our first date. And we, in September, we married 27 years, so we've been together a long time. Um, so there's a lot there, and we don't have kids, so work becomes a lot of our lives. Uh, so it's interesting. I think when you own your own business your life can become very intertwined. And I think we found that it became much easier to live life authentically and not try to compartmentalize your life. So I, didn't, I don't think I have a button, but Peter bring up the, um, I'm not gonna put it on though. Um, but, so so even like, you know, Peter, I, I'm not as active politically today. I'm actually, I'm missing a flag day luncheon, which I, it's like the first time in many years because my garden club is having their annual lunch and they announced it first, but just, you know, when you have a set of core values and you know who you are, it is um, natural and comfortable to live life authentically. And not trying to hide pieces, I think is really important. Um, I think you also, it's a balancing act of not shoving things. I think the, the world right now is at the point where it's like this. And like people are like fighting and shoving. It's more like, okay, how do we share and, and you know, be our authentic self, but you don't have to put other people down because they don't necessarily agree um, with who you are or what you believe in. And th this was hysterical. So Peter did try <laughs> every possible way um, to, to get me to run. And we had a very political year, it was 2012. We had a lot of politicians um, coming through. I, I know Go uh, Governor Baker had come through, Senator Warren had come through that year. Um, and so he started this campaign. But the funny thing is, actually, the year before the pandemic started, somebody actually came to me and asked if I'd run for Congress. They were putting us, they wanted to put a slate together of nine women, um, one from each district, to all run as a slate. I personally don't believe in doing something like that because I think we're all individuals. I'm too, um, I believe in my core values. And I think one of the problems in politics right now is people don't. Um, operate from the core values, they operate by the polls. Mm -hmm. So what the, what will get me reelected as opposed to saying what is what I believe and I opted not to do it. I opted not to do it for a couple of reasons. One, I do see the gray in the world, but I don't want to, I, you know, as much as I have a public life, you know, what they do, what we do to politicians right now is just awful. And we're, you know, we don't, uh, we're not going to get the best field of politicians because of the scrutiny we've put, and you know, it's probably changed. It's probably it's gotten worse. I think um, the average person is just not going to put themselves through that, and and, uh, and it's also extremely expensive to run for office. I mean, even to run for selectmen, the amount of money people are raising to do something like that. So, um, I am, you know, I'm not. Um, I don't hide from from things. You know, one of the interesting things is I'm a conservative in Massachusetts. Um, and that's not always easy because it is not necessarily a conservative state. 
And if your views don't, you know, so for me, run as a conservative in Massachusetts, there's a strong chance that um, you don't get a lot of support. But I also believe people will get a lot of support if they are true to who they are. Um, a great example, two, two examples I'll pull out, Vinny DiMasito down in Plymouth. <laughs> Vinny never hid that he was a conservative and he got along with everybody. The other one, a little more um, controversial is Bob Hedlund. Uh, Bob isn't necessarily a, con a conservative, he's more of a libertarian, but Bob made his own way. I mean, he just, he, you know, he still continues to live by his values. So you can like him or not, but you know, so those are two examples I've seen. Um, so weaving, you know, I feel like when you have your own business, one, you know, for people to get to know you, you have to figure out how people get to know you. So getting involved is really important. Um, but I also think that's a responsibility we all should carry as citizens is to get involved, whether it's getting involved, you know, and, you know, you become a PTA mom in a kid's school, or you do the, you know, you teach religious education at your church. I mean, our, our country is so unique because it's based on us volunteering. When you look to other countries, a lot of European countries, people don't volunteer. They're paid to do things. So we have this really amazing system where we just, like, we volunteer. And I mean, I know there's lots of uh, not-for-profits here. You couldn't exist without people volunteering. And I think it's, you know, it's part of our nation and it's part of our giving back to make our community so rich and vibrant is to, to be involved. Um, so I don't know if I touched on enough things there. So this, I want to talk just a little bit about this, just to give an example of what Paul has done. So this book, Rise Up, um, it was really pulled, you know, you, you created it from your, your grandmother, correct? Like your experience with right, your yeah. grandmother and passing away. And you, you linked it to the work that you do. Yeah. Um, how, is that how this came about or how, talk a little bit about how you. So it's actually, uh, uh, this book came, um, so Life Lessons and Success, I'm a co-author in this and there's a mini chapter, my chapter, I produced it to its own book, so um, over there if you want one, if you haven't gotten one. Um, I, I went to a Jack Canfield uh, program, so uh, Peter knows, I, I did Tony Robbins programs and then from Tony I went and I walked on fire and I gone on to do the Jack Canfield and I became a. Um, a trainer, I learned his pr principles, and my group of graduates, 36 of us, contributed to um, writing a, a chapter in this book, Life Lessons and Success. Each of you wrote success, a chapter? Each wrote a chapter. My first program that I went to, I had the idea to come up, I was going to write a book for, journal, uh, for widows, sort of similar to Jack Canfield's Chicken Soup for the Soul, so I was going to get widows to put together and share their stories. Um, not everybody wants to share their story. Mm -hmm. So it was like, this is going to be really hard. So then I, uh, I morphed it into inspirational quotes. I love to collect quotes. Uh, and this is two, 10 chapters, 200 quotes um, in total, and then five writing prompts. Because I find uh, people need to get things out of their heads um, and then back into their heart. And journaling is a great way to do that. So we have niche to work with midlife widows over the last few years. Uh, population that my grandmother Mary was widowed at 50. Um, the average age of widowhood is 59, if you're not aware. Uh, it, it is so is very young. And I, I mean, I came across a woman who spoke to a group that I have the other day. She was widowed at 33. She wow. had twins that were, I think, like six and then 18 years old. And her husband was driving and he had a cardiac arrest and died. I mean, so it's like all age groups um, that it happens to. And I wanted to create a resource that supported them. So uh, after I finished all my Canfield training, I published this last summer. And it took me almost three years to get it right. I really, very, the, the look had to be right. But if the cover has pink in it, it it's spring, it's hopeful. I am not someone who lives um, life um, as a victim or in depression or looking for the negative, I look for the positive. So even though widowhood can be a very challenging time, you still have to look for the blessings in there. And I wanted to bring hope. Uh, which How have your clients um, responded to it? Um, interesting. So I've been trying to give it to all clients so that they're rare. And one, the widows are very grateful. Um, some have said it's too pretty to write in. I'm like, it's only $15. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can get the one to just read and you get it done. Uh, but a lot of people have had really good response. So giving it to non-clients, this is kind of interesting. I went to give it to one woman, she's 65. 
She's a bit eccentric, and she was like, no, 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 I do not want that anywhere near me. I do not, no, 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 thank you, no, just keep it. We don't like talking about finance freaks people out and thinking that they're going to be alone freaks people out. And that was what was happening. I was triggering her that way. And um, Bill wrote a book, um, Inheriting Your Spouse's IRA, How to Keep More Money. So we sent out, it's a little smaller, we sent it to all clients. We got some feedback like, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So people are very uncomfortable. I mean, I could go on a whole thing around grief and death, but like we're all going to die. I mean, it is, we were born to die. I mean, it's, it's just the fact, uh, but people do not want to talk about it mm -hmm. at all. So I'm, I'm, I'm working with the Duxbury Senior Center to create a new program around um, that. I mean, I try to get people talking about end of life issues because if you get caught, not prepared, you know, I mean, Renee, you probably see it every day, you know, servicing people at the end of life or, or very vulnerable times, it is very uncomfortable. Um, and it can be very painful and very expensive as well. You don't want to see that happen. Do you do any pro, is it when somebody has lost somebody or do you do any work to help prepare beforehand? Like what Ideally, I mean, I, I do a talk about the gift of preparedness. So I mean, if I get people, do a financial plan and get their ducks in the order before. I mean, we all, everyone here should have a financial plan. It, some people's will be like thicker and bigger than others, and some would, might just be in some documents done. Um, but the other important thing, you know, my brother-in-law passed away in February. Thank you. And he, um, you know, he he had nothing. I mean, so it was like, okay, he had three different um, wives or women that he was in relationship with. He had two different, two of them different were. Um, mothers of two of the children. The last one didn't have any children. You know, kids are now twenties to thirties. I want my father. I want uh, open casket. I want a funeral. I don't want that. Like, can you imagine? Like the tension at the time. Like, you know, you can't even think. So, like, everybody needs to do these things and, and just be buttoned up. So, um, and then I believe it's like carrying an umbrella when things are going to rain. It's not going to rain. You know, you, you're gonna hopefully make it an insurance policy for yourself. And then switching gears a little bit, and like really focusing on on leadership, you've obviously held positions and leadership within the community, um, and it, within your work too. I mean, you're you, you're hiring a yep. few people now. So, how does leadership show up for you, and like, what's your mindset for for it? Is it something that you're you're thoughtful about with it, and there's elements or is it something that's more natural? So uh, with our, so we've been very small um, over the years, Bill and I, and we've had a, um, an admin on for about five years. Um, we, we just hired a certified financial planner who's working remotely from Vermont. So we, you know, we've embraced the Zoom world. Um, <laughs> we actually moved to Nantucket for eight months during <laughs> COVID. Um, you didn't even know it? Ah, oh, that's funny. Peter's my neighbor. He didn't even notice that I was there. <laughs> Well, I guess most cars were in the driveway. <laughs> but you don't always go all the way as far as my house. But we, we took advantage. I was like, okay, if we're going to be on Zoom, let's go do something. So we like realized well, we can actually hire via Zoom and you can work with anybody in the, across the country via Zoom. Um, but I think um, it starts first with our clients. You know, we have to be leaders for our clients. We, you know, our, our role is to really get our clients to the promised land, their <coughs> promised land. You know whatever it means to them so you know your retirement your retirement are going to look very different you know you may be totally happy staying home and watching tv and you're going to go and like travel the world and you're going to go start a nonprofit. like so everybody's amount of what they need and where their vision is of what it will be is so different so we have to draw that out of them and then help them set a realistic plan to get there um so it starts there and now we're all with your transitioning into that managing of people. Um, Jennifer and I were talking about that. That, you know, this is gonna be interesting because you, you can quickly not do what you, your job was and now you manage people. And I used to have a career in human resources. Uh, I was a head of HR for a credit card company in Delaware and I also did uh, college recruiting. I love the college recruiting. Running HR was like, I always said it was like wearing shoes, two sizes too small. I could do it, but it was like, oh, I ever did every day. I was like, 
no, can't do this. This is what the rule was like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, I'm a, I'm a, it's changed a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, it was, yeah. I mean, I had, oh, I've had employees poisoning, you know, like they're getting poisoned by their wife and trying to kill them and, uh, like, just wacko things that happen. It's probably we true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably true. No, it was true. <laughs> <laughs> it was true. That was the was She was putting the arsenic in his food and his toast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so it's like, and then the, just the, the other part of it, so figuring out how to motivate. So, uh, you know, one of the projects, uh, self assessments Bill and I did over the last years, um, we went through this unique ability uh, process. And there's a book out there by Julia Waller, um, Unique Ability. She's uh, part of the strategic coach team. And when you figure out who you are and when you can operate in your unique ability, life is effortless. And so, we've done a number of assessment tools. We, we regularly use the, the Colby A index with all of our clients to help. Um, us understand how they operate and help them um, deliver information to them best. And often people who are married, it's really pretty eye-opening when they get to see that. Um, and we use another one called Print and another one, uh, the Clifton Strength Finders. And so when you start to ma marry these all together, it, it will help us, you know, allow people to, you know, we're going to bring on another admin next week. And so the current admin, some things are going to come off our plate and move around. Um, but that's going to come with growth and it's our job to help make sure she stays in her zone of genius and get to the next level. And then there's the leadership in the community, which I think is important. When I did the chamber, at the same time I was chair of the Columbus Philharmonic Orchestra, and they met the same day. <laughs> and they met, one met at 7.30 in the morning, or 7 for cut, and then the other met at 7.30 at night. And I look back and go like, you really do have more energy when you're younger. <laughs> it really, you do, um, I, I find you have less energy, as I, and I have less interest in doing something like that. I, I would have never planned to do it that way, but it just kind of worked out. That was a lot. Um, when I was at the chair of the Philharmonic, we had had um, an orchestra member for 26 years who ran as the, was the executive director for 25. She left. I literally, like my first board meeting, we were in a, they were basically hiring the replacement. It was like a 26-year-old um, Yale music graduate who was currently working at the Hard Rock Cafe in Boston. She imploded with it once. I mean, I would have never hired her. I got, but the board was already like the, they were out, they were going to do it, but that didn't work. I ended up being part of five um, executive directors mm -hmm. in my time on the board there. That was tough. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think you learned from it all? Like looking back, or what is it giving you? Like, what are the yeah, things that it's giving you? Um, make decisions quick and fast early. Like, don't let things linger. I, mean, I, I was very, um, like I, you, you often know, it's, don't keep trying to rework it when someone's not fitting. Um, bless and release them early. I learned that a lot in my HR. You program. say bless and release them early. Yeah, I mean, I had one woman when I was um, I was working for a company called Whopper Digital, which was the founding company of Priceline. And this woman, I must have, she came into me like three or four times, and I kept saying, "No, you did not get that right. No, you did not get that right." And I let her go within three weeks. She's like, "You didn't give me a chance," and I was like. We went through like some projects three or four times, like you just couldn't follow basic directions, like it's not gonna change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and I think also letting people go with dignity. I had another woman I had to let go um, when I was working in Delaware. And I remember we ended up sitting next to each other at an outdoor restaurant and her husband or boyfriend was like shooting me evil eyes, but <laughs> she and I were okay. Like, we, cause we, you know, we had a good conversation. It was like, sometimes it's just business. We just have to make, our decisions and you're better not to drag them out just let them make the decision and go um that's a that's i think really important and then the philharmonic was you know how do you when I mean, you deal with a board and you can't you know it's a whole group one of the best things was um learning the talking stick does anyone you know that one now like like when everyone's trying to talk you have to find a talking stick and it's like only the person who holds the talking stick can speak at this moment because you know people like over talk and then you, some people overshare too much and you have to control like, and not let um, dominant overbearing people, you know, so they aren't always the brightest or the smartest. Um, sometimes your quiet person is the one that you have to help um, give an opportunity to speak up and, and like noticing it. Like, right. I think really reading a room, and that's one of the things I'm, I think I'm very good at is uh, like these retreats that I've done 
and I know tomorrow's been on the tree with me. Best thing I've ever done, ladies. <laughs> definitely do the next one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you know, you have to let you have to like observe, like, okay, you know, I'm like I was looking at you, Ellie, right now because you're looking away. But um, <laughs> I think, you know, you gotta look and say, okay, maybe what's going on? I might know a little bit about her. She's got some thoughts in her head that's like at the right time you go, I said, Oh, do you have anything to share? It's like sometimes you just have to draw things out um from from, from people and then also, you know. Don't push too hard, but sometimes you have to nudge people along to get them to that next spot. Do you think as a as a business owner that it's critical to be involved in the community um, and cast a net with different organizations or be part of a board? What do you I, what are your thoughts on I that? I think um, I think it's for a human being, it's great to um, to do that because you just you get to use new skills. I remember when I, I worked for um, Braxton Associates, which was a division of Deloitte, and we would hire the young college students. Uh, they would usually work for two to three years, and then go back and get an MBA. And they were like, oh, "I need to manage people." That was it's funny. They always come in my office. Oh, I need to manage people. I need to manage people. You know, back then that you think that's the, the gold mm -hmm. standard. Now you're like, no, we don't want that. <laughs> but I, I would say to them, like, you can get that responsibility. Go out and be a part of um, be a part of something in the community. And actually, one of the interns that we had, he. Um, Great kid, Eagle Scout from Duxbury, went on the maps, and he's now working at a, he thought he wanted to work at a Bain or a BCG, and he didn't get that shot, so he's working at a smaller consulting firm now in Cambridge, but he's working with a not, um, a not for profit, and he's like taking on big leadership roles and helping them try to raise money. Um, it's, a, it's a literacy program, and he's like going to meet with donors, he's going to do all this. These are things that he'd never get a chance to do in his day to day job for many, many years, but he was smart enough to take that opportunity to go out and do something in the community. And I mean, our, our, our cities and towns, the chambers, the not-for-profits, they all need this help and they, you know, they welcome it. And you can just take on, again, learn new skills, get to leadership roles that you would have never maybe gotten to in your own organization. I have lots of friends who have never done it in different companies and like, you know, I can think of one friend, he's, you know, he has done a lot of that at his golf club. So I guess he's giving back that way, but I think sometimes casting the net or things that good. aren't necessarily traditional or yeah. you know, what you would just stretch a little bit. And I know when I finished my, I mean, the chamber very active six, eight years. Um, I kind of got on the board. Next year I was on the executive committee, and then the next year I was in the rotation to be chair. So I was like, <laughs> uh, but then I needed a break. And so one of the things that like, for me that was happening at that point was faith, my faith life was really. Um, resurging. I kind of drifted away from my faith life, born Catholic, but went to Catholic grammar school, went to Providence College, moved <coughs> to Duxbury. I could see the church steeple outside my bedroom window, and then I stopped going to church because stupidly, like, we went to breakfast on Sunday morning, and I just didn't <laughs> ever. And, and then I got back into it, and it was like, you know what, now I'm feeling the calling to do things like in my church. And I got on the parish council, and I'm a lector, and I, I brought this national speaker. Um, I tried to connect that whole organization locally and actually uh, Dynamic Catholic was Matthew Kelly and I've gotten the parish to be one of the Dynamic Catholic parishes in the country and I've matched the Archdiocese, there's five. And so like those things became more important to me. Mm -hmm. So and then now I'm feeling like, okay, I've done that. My, you know, what's next? Actually, I sit on um, the, the uh, trustees for the fundraising board for NOLA VNA and that's been wonderful. Like to, to be able to see how end of life and like helping my clients because you know they're aging and oh, things just happen or my own my parents are aging and darlene you and i've talked about that like oh, my in-laws and my parents and suddenly feeling that sandwich generation of having to take care of them um and like you know you got to have different skills and resources at different periods of life and uh and actually renee one of the um the guest at the hospice home she, that i know she's there and she's like you have to come up for lunch she texted me last night so mm -hmm. uh, it's just amazing to be able to just keep widening and shifting and seeing different places because your, your interests change. Right, right. And when you think forward and you think into the future, number one, what do you think it says for you know the South Shore? What do you see happening? Um, and what do you think is important for leaders to keep in mind as we go forward? A little beyond the South Shore, I think for me what I've seen is this delay that people are having in adulting. We'll say, like, I, I saw a t shirt on vacation. It's all things overrated. Uh, this, but people are, are not like 
moving through the cycles of life in the way they used to. So now, you, you know, kind of joke, you don't move out of your parents' basement until you're 26. Well, I had my first house at 26. Um, you know, you, I got married at 28. You know, it's like, ah, oh, you get married, 32, 34, 36. Um, and then you have kids. And so, like, you know, people used to have their kids in their <clears> early 20s, and you, by 50, like, your kids were off to college, you were done, you were kind of on to the next phase of life. Now, I have a brother who is 40, 48 and he's got a one and a half year old like I started thinking about it one day um, 55 she's one and a half and it, like I started thinking like how will I how will I know her how will she know me like you start to think differently it, it changes the family dynamics the family structure so when you were you know your kids were off and you were ready to do things maybe in your 40s you'd get back to the community maybe in your 50s you're getting to that point um, and I think we, in, I think we talked about this over the years People aren't volunteering the same way they used to. Um, you don't. In what, in what way? You don't see the, the, the civic leaders stepping up um, because they don't have the time. You know, they're, they're just trying to get to a kid's soccer, baseball game, and like just, you know, you, you've got two parents often working. Like, there's just not the time to give back. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some clients that are Rotarians. I mean, like. You do not miss Monday night rotary. <laughs> like the, the spouse goes, the husband goes, like the business owner, all of it, like their whole life, they did rotary trips, all that. That stuff just doesn't seem to happen. Um, they, and those organizations have had to shift and say, okay, well, you can have multiple people from a company hold one spot. You don't have to, you can have a membership that you don't have to come every week. So I do see that less people are being involved. I think when people have kids, they're very, very involved in everything kid related. But I think you kind of get a, is more to the community than just the kid activities. So I think the civic stuff, the, the things like the chamber, I think the chamber's leadership program over the last few years has been a wonderful way to get people exposed to different things. Like, don't be afraid to, my, my, my highest position I've run for so far has been library trustee, but I did run for that twice. And that, you know, like your name's on a ballot. Um, it's, but like, don't be afraid to do those things. Don't be afraid to have to be nominated um, you know, by your town moderator or city council to like sit on a, a committee and you know, I did open space, I've done police search um, committees, you know, like they're really interesting. And you, the other thing that's interesting when you do this type of work is you meet people of all ages. Uh, I just like, I feel like bad I'm not going to be able to get this flag day lunch at today because uh, I don't know if you've ever met Lee Tenney over the years. So Lee Tenney passed away this year um, at the age of 91 and they're honoring her at this flag day lunch today. And I get a phone call yesterday at 12 o'clock going, not many of us knew Lee that's part of it, uh, this group anymore. Can you write something? So I'm like, okay, like I wrote, not a eulogy, but a tribute to her. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't get to read it, but uh, it, like it, that's been the greatest story. Just like I went to her, her uh, memorial service and like see all of these people that she touched in their lives from all ages. And it's like, that's really special. But if you just stay in your lane, you miss that richness mm -hmm. so that that's really like a maybe a special sauce to life right and do you think um you, you touched on like rotary kind of shifting their way um of kind of expanding and being flexible do you think that there needs to be more of that um <laughs> are there other groups like that come to mind for you that you say you know this is to get you put in and to <laughs> Oh, like just for people to get involved? Yeah. Um, I, I guess organizations do have to find ways to, I guess, stay current. Um, I, I struggle, I say that when I do the big sigh, I think about that around um, religion and church and people don't go to church as much as they used to. So it's like, we have to change the churches. But I also think if you start changing everything, who do you stand for? Like if, the, if you know, if, the, if there's, I think one of the greatest things is you have to have self-discipline and you have to make commitments to things. And for me, like church is a weekly commitment. And that discipline has actually set me free in other ways because I don't have to make that decision again. So that, that's where I kind of sigh on that. I, you know, I do think you have to evolve and figure out that there's um, things all cycle and change. You know, we all think this is the worst of times right now. There's a great book out there called The Fourth Turning. And it really talks about every generation, it's a shift, but guess what? It, it's it's every hundred years it goes, it goes to the same shifts. So like we're really living in the sixties right now, you know, in some form. 
um, the uprising, the frustration. I mean, you can see it in clothing. I mean, like everything just keeps shifting. So we don't really ever change. Every hundred years, we go through that same fourth season cycle. So it, it, this will swing back. Like we all get like, this is, I can't believe it's the worst, it's the worst. It may be uncomfortable, but it's not the worst. It's been bad before. So I think we have to be careful to over compensate for what it is now and you have to sort of say, okay, we're gonna keep things. You have to stay current to a degree, if that makes sense. My last question. Uh -huh. what, are, what are two things that you would tell us or share with us when it comes to leadership that we or advice yep. to give us? Um, know who you are and what your values are. I think that's the, like, the most important and live by those values. And when you have to make unpleasant decisions or, uh, you know, it's okay. I think about uh, Sheila, uh, no, Karen that I went to college with. And when people start to gossip, Karen would say, I'm leaving the room. And I always remember that, like that was really important. She just removed herself. So like if, if it's, if you, if you feel strongly about something, you have to speak up. It, like I have a different point of view. And again, you don't have to do it in a way that's annoying or uh, poking somebody. So I think that's important. And I think you always have to um, stay self-aware. So always be working on yourself uh, and, and mindset is everything. So I'm a big believer in how you start your day and, and your mindset is really important. So what you consume um, mentally, you know, who, you know, who are you listening to? The podcast, what you're reading. I, I, am, I do listen to, um, to the a podcast in the morning for news, but otherwise I do not watch the news. I do not watch television. Um, I do not want those images put in my head. So I'm very careful on how I curate that. Again, I, you know, if people are toxic, I just don't, I choose not to. Family, that's a different way how you <laughs> navigate that, but you find your ways. So, um, you know, be, being that really figuring out what's most important um, to how you start your day, because that sets the tone for everything. Um, and, you know, you probably all heard this quote before, but you are the five people, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You choose them very carefully. And those of you who have children that, you, you know, I've spoken to confirmation classes, that makes people stop and think. When you're hanging around with the troublemaker, you're going to drift that way. So really, like, don't be afraid to share these types of things with people. And, and so my wisdom, I'll just close with the Wisdom Wednesday that I started with, um, in the pandemic, I just watched people like becoming absolutely unglued, like people were just nuts. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking walks and so I started just doing selfie videos and like a positive message. And um, they kind of really took off and people were like, oh my gosh, this is really good. And I, and I had a woman, um, actually from a job come up to me a couple weeks ago and she said, Paula, I had a day where I, I, I just couldn't get out of bed. And I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go watch some Paula's Wisdom Wednesdays. <laughs> and like, I, the other reason I got up that day, and like, I just giving people, and if they're one to three minutes, right. something to like think about and have a nugget of positivity, like another point of view, like don't get sucked into the fear. I mean, I, I, this is my, my rant again, but the media puts you in fear and wants to keep you there. So you keep coming back to the next headline. Mm -hmm. You can't stand up. You've got to say like, no. Not going to do that. Like, look, look at facts rather than headlines. So, on that note, I'll stop. Well, thank you. You're it's welcome. been it's been great. So much more, even more rich than just our conversation for that. So, thank you very much. Um, we'd love to open it up for questions. If anybody has questions for Paul, or, I have something I'd love Paul to talk about. When I first met you, you were making mozzarella cheese and and teaching a class on it. <laughs> that always stuck in my mouth. <laughs> and it's funny because the Patriot Ledger ended up doing a story on that, and Ray Belanger had the wooden, like when they, like yeah. these type of yeah. things, like here, wooden um, framed piece, and it's in my office. And the funny part is the two women that are in that photo um, are one I've become really good friends with since then, and another woman, like she's been in my life for years, which is funny. So, um, I had, you know, I tried to pursue an interest, so I, I had, oh, the, this would start with the O'Neill Farm in Duxbury. I was on the conservation project to save the historic O'Neill Farm. It was actually an estate planning issue. Two brothers owned it together. One brother died and had no estate plan, and his five heirs needed to be paid out for this 
40 acre dairy farm. The other farmer had um, no children, and so his his children were the Carls, and they wanted to um, make sure he that they that they're protected. And he's still alive today. This project happened like 2004, uh, and those cows are still there. Uh, so I, I was like, wow, what would it be like to make cheese? So <laughs> uh, we were teaching a class in Duxbury to the adult education, and I ran into the um, coordinator as I was going out to learn cheese making out from Western Mass from a woman named Ricky Carroll, uh, who is like one of the nation's like cheese makers, like uh, teaching cheese, and she's got a book, and she's in our backyard. And she said, this woman, uh, Pat said to me, when you come back, you're going to teach a class on this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I did. Um, and I was just like two or three steps ahead of everybody else. But it was like, well, this was great. And my greatest thrill was when um, the farmer, Carl O'Neill, and a bunch of people from the, the O'Neill farm came to one of my classes. So I was like, oh, this is like so special. So I, I did um, offer for nonprofits for a bunch of years, like for, for auctions. Uh, and that was fun. But my supplies of cause I've been retired. I still have them. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It was a great way to meet people. Well, I think it's a good lesson just hearing your story more of you just try different things and really be fearless and it's okay to reinvent yourself yeah. or reimagine yourself and if you said into what you do. And you don't have to have all the answers. You just have right. to have a few more answers than the person. <laughs> and I knew the way she taught me and everyone's like People, yeah, my other big throw was Martha Stone. If anybody remembers Martha Stone, she had stone kitchens. She, um, she was a, ahead of her time in Plymouth, um, very organic um, uh, cooking everything. But I taught at her restaurant, which was now the Rye Tavern. She, mm -hmm. And uh, she very nicely got all organic milk. And I was like, no, organic milk for this. It has to be, you know, it has to be some other way. So it was just funny. It was like, okay. But, but I got to meet really cool people. And, Try new things and then like think on your feet too. Right. And that, that's always interesting. Right. Thank you for asking us that today. Um, you, you know, you, you talked a lot about your volunteer um, experiences. And I, I'd love to know a little bit more um, how did, were they personal interests of yours or were you asked by someone? And what has been maybe one of your best volunteer roles? I think um, you really have to have a passion for what you do. And I, I remember, uh, you know, I got involved with the originally South Shore Women's Business Network and South Shore Chamber and get to know lots of people. And I remember there was a, an attorney, he sat on one of the boards and he said, um, okay, it's quid pro, quid pro quo, you need to guys need to hire me. Like he said to like people around the board, you need to hire me. I'm like, okay, he's not giving genuine service. So if you're doing it just to like think you're going to get something back, I think that's bad. So I think you, you know, something usually inspires you in your life. Like the O'Neill, like I was working, um, I was on the open space committee. I was like, I like being outdoors in nature. That's a way for me to give back. But, you know, but I might not want to do, like, well, I didn't want to, do, I never wanted to do the personnel committee. Like, I was like, no, like, <laughs> open space. I also figured, like, I did that in my town. <laughs> Good for you. Like, that's a lightning rod at times. Um, so I think when you want to have an interest or a passion, um, that you know maybe it starts with like there was a medical issue, you know someone's in your family's touched by Alzheimer's and like that becomes personal and it makes it easy. Uh, and then I think you know listen to when people invite you. Like so there was a woman uh, that I served with on the space, Pat Loring, and she decided to pull me. She saw something in me and she pulled me aside and she gave me the open meeting law binder and she taught me it. And Pat has stayed in my life like through all these different things. And I look at her as a hero of how you learn about saving land and doing all these things. And actually, it's coming full circle because I'm now starting on another project that I'm trying to introduce the Wildlands Trust, Karen Gray, who I met, introduced to Peter, who got involved here, trying to get her connected on something. So I think a lot of it comes from passion. Um, but if you're just doing it because you feel like it's an obligation, it's going to come through and mm -hmm. uh, you'll burn out and it, you, or you'll be too transparent and repelled a little. <laughs> I always find that the excuse people use for not stepping up and joining organizations and being leaders is that they feel that they're time constrained. Talk, yeah. talk a little bit about time and how you manage it. Um, time, it, it, it just, it, it, it's not a priority. So you, we, we put our time to anything that's a priority. 
So people will often say, let me see your date book and I'll tell you what your priorities are. Let me see your checkbook and, uh, you know, or credit card statement and I'll tell you what your priorities are. And I think that's very true. So we, we get into, can, you know, it's convenient to say that. Um, but if, you know, th there's a, uh, a guy who has this questions, you know, you, you, you've been given a diagnosis, you've got one year to live, what are you, how are you going to spend it? That's a oh, not, you've got one week. You've got 24 hours. What are you going to do? And suddenly time shifts and you think about it in a whole new way. And so, you know, I, I think we also, there's a lot of this like, oh, I need my me time, you know. I, I, so it's a balance. I often don't, it's often, my me time now is like my meditation, my morning exercise. Peter and I, you were saying like, when you can't do your morning walk, you're like out of sync. Um, I got her later this morning because I, I did my morning walk and did all these different things. But like that's important. So you have to say this is a priority. Like I'm going again, like, trying striving to eat healthy is a priority. It takes a lot of time to eat healthy. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's much easier, yeah, to grab something from a box or a bag or a window, and it's like, but no, like really planning it. So it, again, it comes back to it's not a priority. Like yeah, people go, I don't have time to go to church. Well, it's a priority. I, I, and I, the way I've made it a priority is I do the 7:30 a.m. mass. There's nothing that's going to get in front of that. Um, because if I say I do the 10 30, oh, I have to go to breakfast, I might sleep in late. It's like, no decision. The other thing is it's, it's making a decision and making it once. Mm -hmm. So if you have to negotiate every morning, like I'm going to go for a walk, should I go for a walk? What time should I go for a walk? It's like, get up and you know, you go for a walk at six 30 or seven, like, and don't renegotiate. Like you get up and this is your time you get up, you don't change it every day. Mm -hmm. So I think those are how you sort of work around some of that time issues, but it, it really is, it's a priority issue. Um, so you mentioned that you're in business with your husband, yes. and obviously many of us can relate to having a husband, but not many of us <laughs> are in business with our husband. So what has been the biggest challenge that you face in working with your husband? So in the very beginning, I came, I had been working for a credit card company, I've been in some really big organizations, I had been in a company, at one point I was part of a division of, of Bank One, so it's like things were bigger, and he had been at State Street for a number of years, but he'd been on his own, and he kept saying, you're so big business and how you think about everything. <laughs> and it often comes up now, but he, he's very entrepreneurial. And, but, but what it really comes down to is this Colby A index help us. There's a measure of fact finds. I'm an eight out of 10 on fact find. I need a lot of information before I make a decision. He's a four. He is an eight and quick start. And I am a seven, but my fact find leads. What it was always about is I need more information. He would be like, Oh, cool! I'm gonna have a cup of coffee. Oh, I'm gonna go do this. Like I'd be like, wait, is that the best coffee? <laughs> like, that the best coffee? <laughs> and he would just do it. And he I, so learning that about ourselves has been easier because he would be an idea a minute, and now we say um, idea of the day. And so I, instead of me going and chasing the idea and researching, because that used to drive me crazy. Like we're gonna go this way with the business. We're gonna go that way with the business. We're gonna do this with the business. So that was um, challenge. We've got that pretty much worked out. And then the other part is making sure you don't talk about work 24 seven because of not having kids, you know, you don't have that other buffer. So we have to try to be careful about that. I'm not saying we're perfect, but try to be more careful. But the other flip side, which is great is we go to conferences together and we can take a couple extra days. Like, yeah. So we can you know, go to a conference in Arizona and go to Sedona. Um, so being able to have that kind of flexibility in our life has been really good. And it's not like I get three weeks vacation. I can only do these. Oh, you can go do whatever you, you know, you can work in and be flexible, do what you want. Uh, but it's definitely like in most things in life, it's around communication yeah. mm -hmm. speaking up. I didn't, yeah, I didn't finish, but I think you asked about what was my favorite volunteer. Um, probably was that O'Neill Farm. Um, it was a true grassroots effort and like one of like it was brainstorming sitting around like we had to raise I think like two point four million dollars and there were multiple ways to do it but one of the things <clears> we <throat> did and like really was exciting is we made wooden cows and we painted them and I love I love doing things with your hands and that I don't know it's like eight or ten or twelve cows and what we did is we moved them around town and people would pay to have the cows come on their lawn <laughs> so it raised some money I mean it was maybe like hundred bucks have to come but it what it really raised awareness and then we auctioned off the cows at the end and I was really proud of that. Um, so that that was like that was that was fun. That like like I really felt that made a huge difference and the 
with that project and, and I met people that I'm still in touch with and those connections still help me today because I'm trying to work on another project so and that was really cool and honing your skills in that time oh yeah yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely it's great to hear that thank you thank you Pastor. I just want to give out before we close out I'd be remiss if I didn't say Thank you to Jackie Collins. I mean, just to be involved in this, um, this is my first year and um, it, to not only sponsor it, but just to get to meet different people. It's just an awesome forum. And I quite honestly probably would have taken a few more years to figure it out, but just to, it goes back to just having different people and casting the net and having them introduce you to, to different things is just, it's priceless. So, and knowing when you. to take the leap and just yeah. say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right, but thank you for today. This was really, Great, and it's so awesome to be in person. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. Please feel free to hang around and have a cup of coffee if you have a few more minutes. If not, enjoy your day. It's going to be a nice one out there. So thank you again for coming. And um, two more plugs. One is for our Backyard Bash, which is Thursday <laughs> evening in our backyard. We hope you can make it. If you're not already signed up, let us know. And then the second one is for our annual meeting, which is on the 24th at noon at Lombardo's. It'll be fun. Get to meet some new business owners in the area and um, just have a fun, casual networking opportunity, too. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>